the islands of Bermuda, shipwreck capital of the world, home to more than 300 known wrecks. Countless others lay undiscovered beneath the shifting sands. Its dangerous ring of reefs ended so many voyages across the Atlantic. Early sailors called it the Devil's Isle. All these people saw Bermuda as this awful place to avoid because you couldn't navigate near it. Pretty much every breaker has a shipwreck next to it, or some piece of a shipwreck, because that's the areas that most shipwrecks first encountered Bermuda and essentially came to their tragic ends. Once laid to rest on the seafloor, these wrecks were reborn as new habitats for life on the reef. Now, coral and fish communities thrive here, including the iconic parrotfish. This nationally protected species grazes algae off the reef, fostering new coral growth and contributing to the distinctive composition of Bermuda's sand. All of the beaches in Bermuda are of coral and origin, so those beautiful pink sandy beaches, that all comes from corals. All our sand is a byproduct of life. This whole island, this whole space, the part that we live on, is life itself. Bermuda is made up of coral reefs, so if you look at the Bermuda platform, we're standing on coral reef structure here now. Covering 280 square miles, Bermuda's extensive reef platform is essential for its tourism and fishing industries. More crucially, these reefs that once terrified mariners of old are now paramount to Bermuda's safety. They are all that protects the islands from the open ocean. The role of coral reefs as a coastal barrier is huge. In Bermuda, it's been estimated that the corals on the South Shore, for example, dissipate up to 85% of the waves that are generated from storms or hurricanes. 85%, that's a lot. If that reef system goes away, if those breakers go away, we're going to have high seas, highly dynamic ocean ecosystem bashing onto what is essentially a sand limestone island. That is literally what keeps us from disappearing. Today, the reef and its shipwrecks are subject to the accelerating impacts of a changing climate. But Bermuda is in a unique position to meet those challenges. Bermuda is really remarkable in that it's kind of a hope spot. Our corals are slightly more resilient in part because they've done a really good job of managing them. They protect the parrotfish. And so there's a lot of thought put into how to take care of reefs and restoration efforts. Gathered together in this tiny tropical haven, local Bermudians and international scientists strive to better understand and protect the islands and reefs they call home. How is climate change amplifying the impact of the open ocean on this small island nation? And what can we learn about resilience from the life that thrives at ocean's edge? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Additional funding was provided by Trish and Dan Bell and by the Perot Family Endowment for Environmental Education. With more than 60,000 residents inhabiting a mere 20 square miles of connected islands, 
Bermuda is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. in the bustling capital of Hamilton. It's easy to forget that this British territory sits atop an extinct, mid-ocean, volcanic seamount. We actually live on the tip of one of the tallest mountains on the planet, on this little tiny pinpoint in the middle of the Atlantic. Originally, it would have been, they reckon, about a thousand meters above sea level, and over time, sea level up and down, and the weather just eroding it down. Now we're at the sort of what you see is Bermuda. Bermuda is in the middle of the high seas. This is a, you know, an ocean volcanic pinnacle that is literally 750 miles from any continent. And it is the wilderness, right? It's an ocean wilderness. This is a high seas isolated island. And you know, it's thousands of feet deep, literally two kilometers from the coast. It is this precise location on the edge of the deep that makes Bermuda an ideal place to study our changing climate's impact on the ocean. Bermuda is unique in that it's really easy to get to the open ocean from here. Um, we can get uh, consistent data of an ecosystem that's usually really hard to get to. So you can study these processes that typically are really hard to study. Since 1988, researchers from the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, now part of Arizona State University, have diligently measured the ocean's physical, biological, and chemical properties. These standardized measurements, taken every month in the same location, are known as the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series Study. We've got, back to the 80s, the ability to look at these trends, and that's the one where we've really started to get, you know, the heartbeat of the ocean. What's going on, and, and how is that shifting with climate change? This unique, long-ranging data set plays a critical role in climate change reports issued by the United Nations. So when they're looking at trying to make predictions about, okay, what should we expect in 10 years if we make good choices? What should we expect in 10 years if we don't make good choices? Is they're looking at the trends that we have right now, and then they use that to project forward. While this data helps provide an objective understanding of changing seas globally, the lived experience of observant Bermudians is equally as important when assessing local impacts and response. Being from a place means you know a place. You love the place, right? So the level of attention you pay to it is also of another quality. You know, it's not somewhere else. It's here, it's home. I think that's the really important scientific component that is easy to kind of not know about Bermuda or to not understand necessarily. So, I mean, I've seen it in my lifetime change in the fact that the dock over here, I mean, you know, we're traditionally now getting more and more tides that have come up over the dock. You know, you've got houses at sea level here that in a few years we expect them to be underwater. So it's not just about, you know, the environment and the environment's changing, it's about how it's going to affect us. While sea level rise is considered a gradual threat globally, islanders are acutely aware of the dangers posed by increasing nuisance events like storm surges and extreme high tides, or king tides. Rising seas aren't just about averages, they're about extents. It's very important for us to get down to the local level because the averages may mask substantive changes at a local level that come far, far sooner than you might anticipate from what we project out forward into the future with the averages. And so long before your average tidal change, is driving the kind of adaptation or the kind of problems that we need to adapt to, your nuisance events are achieving the same thing. You know, if it happened every year, that's one thing. If it happens every week, then you're dealing with change that's happening now. Bermudians are also witnessing an acceleration of the ocean's natural and ongoing reshaping of the islands. There are certain areas where you can see the erosion happening quicker and quicker. We're made up of a majority of limestone. As the, as the oceans get more acidic, we're going to dissolve faster. So worse storms, more acidic oceans, it's just not good news for us. 
One of these places is Charles Island, where signs of rapid change are alarmingly evident. With each passing storm, more land is lost as the center of the island collapses into the sea. So this is Charles Island, and as a kid, I always remember this being sort of one, you know, sort of silhouette of the island going across. And as time's gone on and storms are becoming more and more frequent and, and even stronger, it won't be long before this ends up being two islands. So I would reckon by the end of next hurricane season or the year after, this will end up being two islands. I mean, the last storm, the last big storms we had, you could see waves washing right up over the top. And obviously you've got soft limestone with pounding seas. It just doesn't have a chance. These storms not only erode fragile shoreline, but also shift significant loads of sand around the reef platform. Imagery from NASA's Landsat satellite shows the extent of sediment movement following Hurricane Gonzalo in 2014. Sand was dispersed up to 30 kilometers from the island. We're very used to in Bermuda that sort of dynamic ocean environment affecting our beaches, especially on the south shore. And there's a lot of sand movement, but the big dramatic shifts where you're like, wow, 15 foot of sand has gone from this beach. You know, in my childhood to young adulthood, I probably saw it twice. And I'll say that in the last 15 years, I've probably seen it about six times. As Bermuda's custodian of historic shipwrecks, Dr. Philippe Rouge collaborates with local divers to monitor the integrity of the island's underwater cultural heritage. Shifting sands have been known to reveal historical artifacts and uncover hidden wrecks. And you know, I, I've been at the job now for 17 years, and in the first seven years, I was certainly surveying shipwrecks after storms and hurricanes. But I'd say in the last five years, we've just had this consistent ramping up of these kind of weather events that are reaching deeper into our reef areas and actually impacting these shipwrecks at a higher rate than before. One of these wrecks is a rare American Civil War blockade runner, the Marie Celestia, which sank in 1864. About 12, 15 years ago, we started seeing that sand go, and enough of it went during Hurricane Fabian and other storms. That part of the stern that you only saw for three days after a storm is now visible all the time. So that says to us is that sand is not returned. What does this shift mean? It's not just a shift anymore. Is it moving out to sea? This immense ocean energy, capable of moving football fields of sand overnight, may suggest deeper impacts. You know, there's a difference between the whitewash that people think is the force of the ocean and the true force of the ocean, which is the swell. You know, that big, deep ocean swell, the way it moves in and cruises over the reef platform, and that's broken up on our outer edge. And it's only speculation, but we're kind of feeling like the energy of that blue water is reaching deeper and deeper into the platform. The direct impact of these swells can be seen today on the wreck of the Montana, Bermuda's only other Civil War blockade runner. As Hurricane Humberto swept across Bermuda in 2019, deep wave action decimated the bow of this beloved dive site. This is a, you know, a very iconic shipwreck that we're all quite attached to and we have you know, very fond memories of diving. You know, there was a very attractive and very kind of iconic bow section to the Montana that we used to be able to go into and swim around and come back out. And now there's a whole aspect of the ship which is gone. It literally got blasted to smithereens. It was as if it was made of China and the thing just got pounded. And all the corals that were attached, there was a beautiful field of coral growing across the side of the bow. And it was just literally broken into little pieces. And we just had this coral that just sort of went through a blender. 
Examining the exposed forepeak of the shattered bow also revealed archaeological artifacts that would require protection. However, concern for the scattered corals was also a priority. You know, the first thing was, oh my god, the shipwreck is damaged. And the next thought was, well, let's rescue the corals. It was sort of one and the same. It wasn't like I had to think about it. And me and many other divers, I think this is the way the diving community in Bermuda reacts to this. So it's, it's not about caring for just this one part. It's all interwoven. They are inseparable. Fortunately, Philippe had worked just a few years prior with the Cultural Heritage Engineering Initiative at the University of California, San Diego, to document the bow in extremely high resolution. This thing is lost in its sort of physical aspect, but we have literally preserved it in, to the highest degree that we possibly could in this digital sort of matrix, so to speak. But in this case, what's great about it is it, it allows us to also document the process of the corals being moved. We now have a baseline from which you can measure any new coral growth that happens on that shipwreck. And so the shipwreck becomes a, a focus for science that we couldn't do before. All that can be compared and contrasted and scientifically analyzed and assessed going forward. Today, Philippe and the diving community continue to monitor the Montana and the dislocated corals. But the unexpected destruction of this cherished cultural site has raised more profound concerns about the future impacts to the reef and the wrecks resting upon it. What happened to the Montana with that sort of blue water reaching in and creating that damage, only blue water could do that to that wreck, only that level of energy. Well, what does that say about the larger forces at play? You can have a 12-foot swell out in the high seas ocean and on the inside of the shallow bar and you know you're having a flat calm day that's what the reef gives us right and if that changes that's a dramatic shift that's a big change as home to one of the highest latitude reefs in the world Bermuda is fortunate its unique location has kept its corals relatively healthy in the face of rising ocean temperatures I think we do have the really tough corals here because the corals here, they need to be able to overcome the seasonal changes as well. Like they, they naturally experience a really large range of temperature. Only species that are really tough are actually able to thrive in an environment like Bermuda. Because we get this wide temperature range, we get gradients in these environmental parameters across our reef platform. So this gives us a natural laboratory. Back at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, coral ecologists are conducting a multi-year experiment to better understand the unique resilience of Bermuda's corals. Resilience basically means whether or not you can absorb a certain stress or disturbance. It's how resistant are you against a stressor. So it's either like the coral is not really reacting to the stressor, or it's reacting, but it's bouncing back really quickly and easily. The idea there is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So if a coral goes through a thermal stress event, is it more likely to be more tolerant to that stress event in the future? We want to know which of these corals are going to be the winners. And once we finish these thermal stress experiments, we're going to be putting the remaining coral pieces back on the reef and we're going to assess them over a year. We're going to bring them back in again next summer and we're going to run another thermal stress experiment. So the idea is to see that the stress of our simulated bleaching event last summer, has that allowed a legacy or a memory of that thermal stress in order that if we do it again to them the following summer, that they are more resilient to that. Researchers also want to know if this learned heat stress resilience can be passed down through generations of corals. So one aspect of the research is we are looking at epigenetics. So we want to see if coral stress tolerance is passed on to the juveniles. If we stress an adult coral, does that make its larvae 
and the subsequent juveniles more tolerant to future stress events as well? And how long is that memory of that stress? Does it last for a few months? Does it last for a year? Does it last for longer? Working in parallel with ecologists, aquaculturists like Dr. Sami Asarkis are applying increased coral resistance to restoration, repairing reefs damaged by stressors like storms and hurricanes, and even modern shipwrecks. Corals in Bermuda are impacted a lot by human activity. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a vessel grounding, there's no reason why we shouldn't go back and restore that coral reef. After a Norwegian cruise line ship veered off Bermuda's North Channel in 2015 and cut this 100-foot gouge in the reef, Sami joined government officials in surveying the damage. We have the resources to be able to act, and at least we have to have the ability to respond to it and to help mitigate. We have to actually make sure that we have in place a system to be able to preserve the corals that we have. In 2014, Samia founded the Living Reefs Foundation to support the health of Bermuda's reefs and improve coral cultivation and restoration. In their on-island hatchery, her team is developing scalable, reliable, and cost-effective methods for rearing new corals. And there are many, many challenges to growing corals. They're very, very complex. It's probably one of the hardest types of cultures I have ever had to do. But what we do is really concentrate our efforts on species that are important for the reef building aspect. And in so doing, you're actually protecting and always enhancing the coral reef ecosystem along the coast. When corals from the hatchery are ready to be transplanted out, they're brought to the foundation's coral gardens. So the coral gardens are essentially an ocean-based nursery and there they basically adapt to the natural environment and then they will get to be a size where we can actually take those and plant them or cement them directly on the reef base of a damaged area. Samia also envisions a future where coral restoration will be used to reinforce man-made structures such as seawalls and connective roadways. There's key infrastructure areas in Bermuda that could benefit from a more enhanced coral barrier. So this is where we have to prioritize. Is it more cost effective to actually build a man-made barrier that will actually erode gradually every year and that has to be replaced every four or five years? Or is it more cost effective to invest into adding corals and restoring the coral that is there and that will actually, instead of eroding, it will actually build and strengthen and become a sufficient coastal barrier. There's a ton of work to be done because, you know, we, we're really only touching the tip of the iceberg here. Working at the edge of science and living at the edge of the ocean Researchers in Bermuda recognize the island's symbiotic relationship with its coral reefs and know all too well the need to adapt to the changing seas that surround them. Though sailors of old once avoided these treacherous waters, scientists today explore them for local lessons that could impact resilience globally. We used to be this place where there were all these shipwrecks, right? And you had to be careful, but people wanted to come because it was a stopover place. And so we build these lighthouses, right? And we're this, this beacon. And here we are still in the center of the Atlantic Ocean, serving as a hope spot where we have healthy reefs that potentially might do really okay as climate change occurs. And as you make these choices about how are we gonna to respond to this sea level rise, we're having that conversation and looking at it directly and thinking about 
we're gonna be dealing with climate change. Okay, let's move beyond that. What can we do? How can we do this constructively? You know, the motivation to fix things has, uh, it's never been stronger and more current. And, you know, when you're from here, or when you work here, it's small. And for us, these are very local, very intimate problems, very intimate questions, but they're also things that it's all within the context of, this is a place we love and enjoy and want to nurture. Bermuda can be referred to and have influence way beyond what you might imagine because that local knowledge, that local thing matters. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Additional funding was provided by Trish and Dan Bell and by the Perot Family Endowment for Environmental Education.